Wassalatu wassalam ala Rasulillah. We praise him subhanahu wa ta'ala, the king, the master, the sustainer, the creator of the seven heavens and the earth. And we send peace and blessings upon his beloved Muhammad. Salawatu rabbi wa salamu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. My brothers, if there's anything that united humanity at large, if there's anything that brings every human being together, regardless of race, color, creed, religion, nationality, regardless of all of these things, if there's ever anything that we all agree upon unanimously, it's the issue of death. The atheist believes in death. The Jew believes in death. The Christian believes in death. The Muslim believes in death. The religious believes in death. The non-religious believes in death. The murderer, the drug dealer, whatever you want, there isn't a single soul on the face of this earth except he believes, he admits the fact that there is death and that is coming. There's no exception to us here tonight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, and of course whenever we mention Quran in English, it's a very loose translation. You know? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran more or less, He says, every single soul shall taste death. No one, have no doubt in your mind, no one will escape death in any way, shape or form. By Allah, if anyone was going to be free from death, if anyone was going to escape the grip of death, then surely, surely it would have been Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But even he had to die. My brothers, the truth is, is we live in this world and we've been fooled to believe that we're here forever. You're not here forever. This world that we live in is a transit. You're here for a temporary time and every single one of you is moving on. No one is to remain. No one is to stay behind. We're all leaving this world. Every single, sh every single soul shall taste death. Everyone will die. Everything will come to an end. Everything, that's, that's, every living creature will come to an end. Everything will cease to exist except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one that never dies, the one that never sleeps, the one that never tires. But everything else will come to an end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and no one knows when his time is up. And no one knows how much he will earn, and no one knows in which land he will die in. This is all aim that's ghayb. This is all knowledge that's only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he spoke about life in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions death. He says, we created death, then we created life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, we created death, then we created life. Ajib. An amazing thing. Surely you would think, anyone would logically think, that if I'm going to speak about creation, surely one would mention life, then you speak about death. Yes or no? Yes. And what's the point in saying I created death, then life came in after that? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting that your asal, that your origin is death. This world is not for you and I, my brothers. This world is temporary. Don't forget that statement. The Prophet of Allah, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, remember death. Remember the destroyer of pleasures. Remember that which destroys desires and pleasures and wishes. What is it that destroys your pleasure? And what is it that destroys the wishes? It's the remembrance of death. To remember the fact, Wallahi, your worries and your problems, your issues, become dwarf when you remember death. Because you come to know, you come to realize that hey, no matter what I'm going through, it's temporary, it's for a short time. And death, my brothers, isn't what you and I think. You see, the truth is, your wishes and your desires and your hopes and your plans, they far supersede the time that you really have. Because no one knows his time. And no one here has been promised anything by anyone. <coughs> We've been fooled to believe that I'm going to live to see an old age. We've been
been fooled to believe that I'm going to live to an old age and I'm going to get married and I'm going to have children and my children are going to have children and I'm going to see my grandkids and inshallah I'm going to reach an old age that's going to give me time to repent. It's going to give me a chance to go to Hajj and it's going to give me a chance to go to Umrah and it's going to give me a chance to do one, two, three and four. And the truth is my brother, wallahi, whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not, every single one of you was dead this morning. Every one of you was dead this morning. Sometimes you and I tend to think, brother, what are you talking about? I'm young, I'm fit, I'm healthy, I'm strong. I feel like I still have another 15, 20 years in me. What made you believe that? <coughs> I'm telling you, every, every single one of you this morning was dead. Who gave you life? What power? Did your money wake you up this morning? Was it your car that woke you up this morning? Maybe it's the house that you live in. Maybe it's the boys, you know. Mashallah, now we've sold our deen because we're, you know, what, what's in Sydney we say we're rolling with the heavies. Here we roll with the dons, huh? Is that what it is, yeah? We roll with the dons. As far as I'm concerned, it's all rubbish anyway. Yeah? Did they wake you up this morning? What's the dark for when you wake up? Who knows? Subhanallah, what? Listen to the listen listen to the sunnah for when you wake up. Listen to the dua that you make when you wake up. Alhamdulillah alladhi. All praise be to the one who what? Alhamdulillah alladhi ahyana. All praise be to the one that gave me life. Ba'dama after he did what? Ba'dama amatana. Every single one of you was dead this morning. Every one of you was dead this morning. <coughs> Who gave you life? Who gave you life? To do what? You see, because we've been programmed to say, yeah, he gave me life to worship him. But do you really believe it? This morning when you were dead to the world, this morning when you had no control over yourself, this morning when your soul had left your body and your soul was waiting for permission from Allah, do I return? Or does he remain dead? What decision did you have in that process? You had no decision whatsoever. Your soul was waiting for permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do I return or not? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his rahmah, from his mercy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted your soul permission to return back to your body. And then you wake up in the morning and how do we pay Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do we thank him subhanahu wa ta'ala? One of the scholars, he was saying something interesting. He said, imagine you woke up this morning. Imagine you woke up this morning. And all that you had is whatever you thanked Allah for yesterday. Imagine this morning when you woke up. When you woke up in the morning, all that you had, the only possessions that you had, is whatever you thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for yesterday. Now you be honest, what did you thank Allah for yesterday? What did you thank Allah for yesterday? We've become ungrateful people. My eyes are always over the fence. I'm always looking at that which I don't have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so much. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and I more than you could ever fathom in your life. And yet still, still ungrateful towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I still don't have time for Allah. I still don't have time for my deen. I still have time to sit down and belittle the sunnah and laugh and joke and giggle about this, that and the other when it comes to my deen. Ungrateful people is what we've become. For someone who pays you a measly wage, a measly wage of whatever it is, what's the current wage a week here? What, a thousand pounds? No? Huh? That's two, two, uh, how much? 50. How much? 250. 250, 300 pounds. A week. That's what you earn. <laughs> Are you serious? The exchange rate is quite low. For 250 pounds a week, the masses, wallahi, the masses, we've become slaves to our bosses. Slaves. Be there at 7, you're there at 650 because you want to show them, hey, I'm not like the rest. Be there at 4 o'clock in the morning, no problems. 
No matter what your boss asks you for, you're there and you're happy to do it for a measly 250 pounds a week. Eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. Wallahi, I know people that do 16 hours a day. For what? For a couple of hundred pounds. Yet the king of kings, the one that gave you your life, the one that gave you your soul, the one that gave you your body, the one that gave you eyes to see, the one that gave you ears to hear with, the one that, subhanAllah, the one that gave you everything that you possess, the one that gave you your father, your mother, your deen, your iman, your tawheed, the one that gave you everything, the one that allows you to wake up in the morning, to sleep at night, the one that, the one that your heart seeks permission from, every time your heart beats, it seeks permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He grants it and He's never let you down once. Allah has never let you down once. The one that gives you all this, you don't have time to perform your five daily prayers. But the one that gives me three, four hundred pounds a week, I'm ready to do the impossible for Him. I'm ready to drive an hour, sometimes two hours in peak hour traffic just to get there because He gives me three, four hundred pounds. But the one that created the heavens and the earth, the one that gave me everything that I have. I don't have 20 minutes in a day. I don't have 20 minutes in a day to perform my prayers. <laughs> because the truth is, my brothers, you and I have been fooled to believe that I still have a long life. That maybe I'm not the best Muslim right now. But we have time, brother. Insha'Allah. Wallahi, my intention is there, brother. You don't know what's in my heart. And then we all become scholars on the issue, yeah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows in one, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in my heart. Yeah, in fact, hypocrisy. That's what it is. That's what it is. My brothers, every single one of you is going to die. And no one knows when his time is. I ask you sincerely. Wallahi, I ask you sincerely, what have you prepared? What have you prepared? Why is it that we don't look around? Why is it that we don't go to the cemetery and look? Look and see the ages. You know, there used to be a time in my life, there used to be a time in my life, yeah? When death belonged to, you know, Abu Ali and Abu Ahmad, who's 70, 80 years old, been to Hajj and, and you know, when I was growing up as a young boy, that's who death belonged to. But now, now, by Allah, almost 70% of the people who die in Sydney, I don't know what the stats are here, yeah, are under the age of 40. <coughs> young boys and young girls, 20 years old and 30 years old and 18 years old and 16 years old, nothing wrong with them. You know, I know of over four, you know, at least of four different cases back home in Sydney, brothers playing football. They're playing football. There's nothing wrong with him. One of them kicked the goal and was doing a celebration for the goal. He fell to the floor, had a heart attack and died. Other one was 17 years old. They're playing some football. Young boys kicking the ball, having some fun. Fell to the floor, never ever got back up. 18 year old boy back home in Sydney, him and his cousin going for a drive, he had a, he had a fancy car, they got to a set of lights, as you do, you drag race, just a bit of fun, one thing led to another, the brother lost control, his car flipped over, killed him instantly, no one knows when his time is my brothers, you don't know when you're going, but what's more important than that is how are you going? How will you stand before Allah? What life are we living now? I ask you sincerely, is any one of you here, and there's always some cowboy, so please just keep your hand down, yeah? Honestly, sincerely, are you ready to meet Allah? Are you ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What are we doing with our lives? What are we doing with our time? Why is it that we're so busy and we're so occupied that I have time for anything and everything except when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And you know, my brothers, you know, this is, this is something I share wherever I go. Don't, don't you dare think, don't you 
don't you dare for a moment think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in need of anyone here. Because there's always, you know, there's, 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 this, there's this mentality now, yeah, with the dons. But listen, bro, don't, 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 don't come to me with your deen, preaching your this, that and the other, trying to tell me what I need to do and what I don't need to do. I'm a big boy, I know what to do, you know, and I can sort myself out. Arrogance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That listen, I don't need this deen and this namaz business of yours. You know, let me do my thing. But let me tell you something, yeah? Whether you like it or not, whether it fits well with you, it gels, it works with you, it doesn't matter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king, is the malik. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of you and I. Not in need. The Prophet of Allah in the Sahih Hadith sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was sitting with the Sahaba, he says to them, أَطَّطِ السَّمَاءِ وَحُكَّ لَهَا أَمْطَئِتْ أَطَّطِ السَّمَاءِ وَحُكَّ لَهَا أَمْطَئِتْ Forgive me my brothers, but you know sometimes, and I'm sure you've heard the hadith, but sometimes you really need to start living the hadith. The Prophet of Allah sitting with the greatest ummah that ever walked the earth, sitting with the sahaba, and this isn't a means of, you know what, I'm not praising them because, you know, our mashayikh tell us to praise them. Allah praised them in Quran. Allah testified. Allah praised them in Quran and said, I am pleased with them and they are pleased with me. The greatest ummah that ever walked the earth, with the Sahaba. And yet the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaking to them, he says to them in the Sahih Hadith, he says to them, you know, I see what you don't see, and I hear what you don't hear. He says to them, verily the heavens have squeaked, and they have every right to squeak. The heavens have squeaked. You know, sometimes when you put a lot of weight onto something, that thing starts giving way, starts making noises, it can no longer carry the load. The Prophet of Allah is telling the Sahaba that the heavens have squeaked and they have every right to squeak. The Prophet of Allah says to the Sahaba, he says there isn't room in all the heavens, there isn't room for four fingers except there is an angel in prostration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some little gangster here in London thinks that Allah needs him or needs his money. There isn't room for four fingers in all the heavens and the earth, except there is an angel in prostration to Allah. There are angels from the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates them, to the day that they stand before Allah on the day of rest, one continuous sajda. I'm telling you, from the moment they were created, until the moment that they... One continuous sajda. I'm not telling you that they went and came and had... No, no, one continuous sajda. And yet when they stand before Allah, they say, Oh Allah, forgive us. For we did not give haq to your ibadah. We didn't do justice to your worship. And I have some little bad boy here who thinks, yeah, man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs my money, bro. Every time I go to the masjid, there's always a fundraiser, you know, and they always come knocking on my door. Keep your money, bro. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, you know, you know, in the hadith could see, yeah, in the hadith could see, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is telling us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, says, Ya ibadi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, and please try to comprehend, really try to comprehend. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Ya ibadi, O oh my slaves, O oh my slaves, the human of you and the jinn of you, the Muslim and the non-Muslim, irrelevant, all of you collectively. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if all of you were together collectively, all, with the exception of no one, if all of you were together collectively, and worship me, and worship me, and worship me, until you all become like the most pure heart amongst you. He says, this does not increase my greatness in any way, shape, or form. And the opposite is true. The opposite is true. If all of us now, if all of us were to come together and sin, and sin, and do drugs, and do alcohol, and prostitution, and this, that, and the other, and run the biggest muck, Run the biggest muck in downtown London and do whatever you please. Free, free ticket. Run a muck and do whatever you want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if all of you, not some of you, if all of you, if all of my creation got together and all of you sinned and sinned until you became like the most criminal heart amongst you, he says, this doesn't take anything away from my mulk in any way, shape or form. Allah doesn't need you and I. Allah is not in me. But it is us who needs Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
My brothers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create us to destroy us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create us to punish us. Allah did not create us to give us a miserable life. Allah created us for His worship. Allah created us for His ibadah. What is it? What is it really? Let's say we live the full life. What are you going to live? 50, 60 years? 70 years? Allah says, worship me for the 50, 60, 70 years. Acknowledge my existence. Follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And in return for you, there is an endless paradise. Khalidina fiha abada. You will be in there forever. Time will no longer exist. Infinity. What's the purpose of our existence? What's the purpose of our life? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily we created the human and the jinn. To do what? To do what, my brothers? Let's be real. Why did Allah create us? What? To build houses? What? To buy cars? And I'm not saying this is haram. Subhanallah, there's always someone who happens to understand that man, Brother Hudu said buying a house is haram. No, that's not what I'm saying. But that's not my purpose. Why did Allah create me? Why am I here? I only have 50, 60 years, and this is being optimistic. Let's say I do live a full life. What do I have 50, 60 years? Most of you have already gone past half time. Most of us, half your life is already gone, and what have you established? Allah says, I created you for what? For my worship, to know me, to acknowledge me, to call to me, to worship me, to obey my orders. That's why you were created. My brothers, wallahi, please understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't care. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't care. It doesn't matter to Allah. Allah doesn't care how many zeros is in your bank account. Allah doesn't care what clothes you wear. Gucci and Louis Vuitton, this is all rubbish in front of Allah. It means nothing. You just feel good because you go to the person that doesn't have what you have. And you go there showing off, feeling better about yourself. That's all. When you buy a half decent car, where do you go to show off? You don't go downtown where everyone's driving Lambos and Ferraris, do you? You go to the people that you know can't afford that sort. And then you start driving around like you're something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't care. Allah doesn't care whether you get married or not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't care if you've got two girlfriends or a hundred. Allah doesn't care how many kids you have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't care how big your home is, how many bedrooms you have, ensuite, granite bench top, stone bench top. It's all rubbish anyway. It's all going. What are you in love with? This dunya, this dunya is temporary. Wallahi, it's nothing, it's nonsense, it's rubbish, and we're in love with it. That's the truth. We're in love with it. Wallahi, we're going to war with each other. Muslims are going to war with each other over what? Nonsense and rubbish. And everything is going. Where will you run? 50, 60 years is all you have. To know Allah and to worship Him and to get closer to Him. And yet, what are we doing with our lives? Where are we going? Anything and everything is important except my deen. And we think it's a joke. Sometimes I talk like this and brothers think, you know, women, have a go. This guy's become an extremist. Brother, I don't need anything from you. Wallahi, make no doubt. I don't want any doubt in anyone's heart. I'm not here for money. I didn't get paid to be here. I didn't leave my wife and my children and my family and my businesses to come here so I can impress you with my speech. Doesn't matter to me. I'm not here for money, I'm not here for fame, I'm not here for anything. Wallahi, I'm here purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm here because I wasted years of my life, years that I have to answer to. You can be a big man now, you can talk all the rubbish that you want, but no one understands there's coming a time you're gonna stand before Allah and you're gonna fuck me whether you like it or not. People acting all tough, he gets pulled over by a police officer. He starts shaking in his boots. 
And yet you and I think that when we stand before Allah, it's going to be an easy process. Yeah, alhamdulillah, man, I used to perform namaz and that, you know what I mean? Prophets were scared. Prophets were worried. Prophets, I'm telling you, prophets that were promised Jannah, they were scared and worried. And you and I, yeah, it's all right, man, relax, bro. What you tripping about, boy? They were worried and you were not yet. It's all right, relax, cuz. Allah's Ghafoor Rahim. Have you heard that? Allah's Ghafoor Rahim. Ayah in Quran, man, can you deny it? Wa rahmati wasi'a kulla shay. People tell me this all the time. Allah says in the Quran, Wa rahmati wasi'a kulla shay. Wow, really? So you understood Quran better. So you understood Quran better than the Prophet. You understood Quran better than Abu Bakr and Umar ibn Khattab and Ali and Uthman. They were worried and scared because they didn't come across wa rahmati wasi'a kulla shay, but you did. Yes. <coughs> Interesting. Wallahi, an amazing, amazing conversation between the Prophet of Allah and Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam. Imagine the greatest prophet and the greatest messenger, you know, the greatest angel and the greatest prophet. Conversation. Amazing. You know, it's like two friends, two buddies, having a chat. And Jibreel says to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says to me, Ya Muhammad, عِشْ مَا شِئْ فَإِنَّكَ مَيِّدٌ Says to my Prophet of Allah, live for as long as you want. For verily there is coming a day you have to die. Says to the Prophet of Allah, and love whoever you want. Love whoever you want. For verily there's coming a day, you have to depart this person that you love. You have to leave them behind. And he says to the Prophet of Allah, do as you please. <coughs> so I say this to the boys, go run a mark, do whatever you want. He says to my Prophet of Allah that there's coming a day where every action that you did you'll be held accountable for. You're going to be held accountable. Death is real, my brothers. Death is not a joke. Death is something that stares you in the face every single day and I ask you, what have you prepared for it? What have you prepared? Don't sit here and look at me and look at the Mashaykh or look at the people. So, <coughs> what was I was speaking about? He says, well, do as you please for this coming a day where you will be held accountable for everything that you do. Death is real, my brothers. Death is a reality. Death is something that Allah subhanahu wa says, فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ And where will you run? Where will you go? Where will you go? You know, my brothers, we can argue this topic about religion and whether or not I need this in my life. But I'm asking you, Allah says in Quran, and where will you go? Where will you run? Where can you go? What other avenue is there for you? Where are you going to, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon? To Allah we belong and to Allah we shall all return. There is no escape. My brother, wallahi, enough with the arrogance. You're only fooling yourself. You're only fooling yourself. You're only harming yourself, my brother. Don't waste your life. Don't play Russian roulette with your life. You only have one. There's no coming back. There's no second chance. There's no second chance. Every day, my brothers, death stares you in the face every day. What have you prepared? And you know, my brothers, the Prophet of Allah, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, the way you live your life, this is how you will die. Do you understand what that means? Brother, if you think that I'm going to live like a bad boy for the next five years, and then after five years, you know, you know, people sit there planning their lives, convinced and content that he's going to live to see it. That look, let me run a mark, let me have my fun. I don't know if, you know, if the boys say this here, you know, but listen, brother, let me go through my jahiliya, yeah? Let me get it off my chest. 
Let me have fun. But what are you like, like, like? What are you claiming? Are you claiming that you're going to live to have a day where you can repent? Is that like, like I mean, is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? The Prophet of Allah, he says, the way you live is the way you die. And the way you die, that's how you stand before Allah. This is how you'll be resurrected. Look at the way you're living, my brother. Don't fool yourself. Look at the way you're living. I know brothers back home in Sydney, people I've known personally. One of them was killed in a strip bar. One of them died, cut off his head while performing zina. One part. I'm not telling you after Zina. He was in the act of Zina off his head. He died. His heart couldn't take it. He died of a heart attack. Any other day, yeah, he's a good boy, man. Yeah, well, why he's down, you know, and he's like this and we're like that. And he has a good heart. Yeah, maybe he doesn't pray. But mashallah, he gives a lot of money in charity. And brother, you don't know. Brother, it doesn't matter to me. Look at the way he died. Look at the way he died. How many of our brothers are dying without Salah, without Namaz, without Quran? How many of our sisters are dying without Hijab? Just Wallahi, just before I came, there was a sister back home and she died and she still had her acrylic nails on. She died in that state. No Hijab on her head. They're calling me, asking me, do we have to take her nails off so we can wash the body? I said, Subhanallah, what a masala. Why have we been fooled to think we're going to live a long life? My brother, don't think about tomorrow. Think about now. What is your condition? What is the state of your heart? What is the state of your deen? Because the truth is, is that's the life you're living. And in most cases, that's how you're going to die. I'm telling you of a man I know personally. This back home in Sydney. Someone I know personally. You know, I'm sure most of you watched this video that I did with Ali Bennett, yeah? I'm sure most of you watched it, and wow, mashallah, Allahu Akbar, it's such a nice video. Fine, whatever, put that aside. I'm sure most of you here think, brother, that if I got cancer, if doctors told me that I had cancer, forget it, bro. I would shut shop, I would leave my work, I would leave my business, and I would spend the rest of my life in Ibadah. Nonsense! You're a liar, man! You're a liar! If you're not doing that now, what makes you think you're going to do that then? <coughs> One of the brothers back home in Sydney, what was supposed to be a blood test, his hand went a bit numb. Young, he was maybe about 38 years old. Never prayed in his life. Like most of us really in truth. You know, Muslim by name and, and mashallah comes from a Muslim home. But never really prayed. Too busy, subhanAllah. Got other things to do. What was supposed to be a simple blood test, doctors called him back and said to him, come back, man. Wait, what's wrong? Brother, you got cancer. What are you talking about? Me? Yes, you was in the state of denial. Anyway, by the end, he finally convinced. He was finally convinced when he had a minor stroke. Now, khalas, so now he believes it. So naturally, what do you think he would do? You would pull up, yeah? You'd start doing what you got to do. So the brother started coming around telling him, brother, you know, you only have a couple of months to live. You should start praying, start making istighfar, start turning back to Allah. He refused, man. Now I'm sure some of you are thinking, astaghfirullah, bro, not me, man. <coughs> Why not you? You're perfectly healthy and there's nothing wrong with you and you're refusing. And so the brothers around him said, Brother, you only have a couple of months. Look how Shaitan works. When you and I hear that the brothers got cancer, we all start feeling what? Start feeling sorry for him. You know that brother Ali, that brother that was in the video? I said to him, Ali, what's your biggest regret? You know what he said to me? He said to me, My biggest regret is that it took a man in a suit and a tie. To make me believe that I'm really going to die. Yet Allah has been telling me all my life and I never believed Him. It took a man in a suit and a tie and a fancy 
and a fancy framed certificate on the back wall. It took that for me to believe with certainty that I'm really going to die now. Yet Allah and His Prophet have been telling me this from day one and I never ever ever believed them. So that's my regret. I have to stand before Allah with that sort of faith in my heart. So this brother now, he's 38 years old. He's only been given a couple of months. Brother, pray, turn back to Allah, start making of God. Something, anything, man. Anything, just don't die like this. He refused. In the months that he was given, you know what happened? His brother that was perfectly healthy died before him. His father died before him. He's still alive and he still refuses to pray. So just before I went to Hajj, someone came to see me that's very close to him. He said, Matthew, you know, do you think maybe you can come and, you know, you're quite good with your dawah and this, that and the other. He's trying to butter me up, trying to convince me to go and try to t talk to him. He said, you know, Allah, maybe you can come. And of course, you know, he's concerned. I said to Makhi, as soon as I come back from Hajj, because he came see me maybe like a day or two before I was going to fly out. I said to him, as soon as I come back from Hajj, I'll come straight to you. You know what happened just before I went to Hajj? In those two days, Allah took, the, Allah took this man's ability to speak away from him. So now even if you wanted to make istighfar, Allah no longer wants to hear it from him. Now yes, what he does in his heart, of course, is between him and Allah. It's not for me to judge. But look at the condition. You know why? Because you live the life of negligence towards Allah. Don't you dare think that Allah SWT is going to give you right at the end just before you die. Don't, please my brothers, don't be fooled by this. You only have one life, ya akhi. You only have one go. And none of you knows when he's going to die. None of you knows. The Prophet of Allah, when he grabbed Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, in the Sahih Hadith, he says he grabbed him by his shoulders. And he says to him, young man, كُنْ فِي الدُّنْيَا كَأَنَّكَ غَرِيبٌ أَوْ عَابِرُ السَّبِيلٌ Be in this world like a stranger, like a wayfarer. Look at the advice of your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's telling Abdullah, be in this world like a stranger, like a wayfarer. You know what that means? Why is it that the words of Rasulullah, they're no longer enough for you and I? What's the Prophet saying? What's your Habib saying? Maybe I'm an extremist. Maybe you think, man, this guy's cracked. I don't know what crack he's smoking. Yeah, but you know, this sort of Islam doesn't fit well with me. Fine. I'm telling you, your Prophet is saying in the Sahih Hadith, be in this world like a stranger, like a wayfarer, like a traveler. Honestly, do you feel like a stranger here? You know, I've seen, you know, I'm an electrician by trade. Yeah? I've seen people when they're renovating and building their homes. Muslims, man, Muslims. I don't care about non-Muslims and what they do right now. This is not the topic. But you and I, people that are supposed to have deen, people that are supposed to have iman, people that are supposed to know that we are going to die. I've seen men and women, couples, families, when they're renovating or they're building their homes and they go to choose the tiles for their bathrooms. Tiles for their bathrooms. Hours and hours. Days are wasted in choosing. You think this color is going to work? Brother, we've chosen this color and this size for the floors and we're going to go with these ones for the walls. What do you reckon? Days of research and color schemes and designers and what does this person think and what does that person think? What does that matter what color the tiles are? What does that matter? But because we love it. Because it's my home. Because I'm going to be here forever. It matters what size the tiles are. And it matters to me what color they are. And it matters, does this color go out of fashion quickly? Or is it going to stay in for a long... What does that matter? But because you're in love. That's why. Because you're not living like a traveler. You're not living in this world like a stranger. We're not. The Prophet of Allah, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet of Allah says in the Sahih Hadith, he says, the Sunnah of Fajr, you know, that's two rak'at. The two rak'at, the ones that you and I are too busy for. The two rak'at, the Sunnah of Fajr, never mind Fajr itself. 
That's another topic. But the Sunnah of Fajr, those two rak'at, the Prophet of Allah says in the Sahih Hadith, they're worth more than the world and what it contains. It's worth more than the whole world and what it contains. Those two rak'at that you and I are too busy for. Yet honestly, if I told you that I bought a brand new car, I bought a brand new Ferrari, or I bought a brand new BMW, or I bought a brand new Mercedes Benz. Brand new. And I parked it in my driveway. And the next morning, someone keyed it, man, from the front headlight all the way to the retail light. A nice big key job. Well, like, just hearing it is frustrating, eh? So, ah, what dogs, man? What do they do that for, bro? God forbid I should tell you, I parked it in my driveway, I woke up in the morning and I realized someone burnt my car. Brand new Mercedes Benz. Wallahi, a non-Muslim can tell you this story. A non-Muslim can tell you, look man, you know, I've been working for 10 years and I saved all my money and I went and bought myself a brand new car from the dealership and then as soon as I came home, I parked it in the driveway, I woke up in the morning and someone burnt it for me. Wallahi, anyone with an ounce, anyone with an atom's weight of any sort of compassion will feel sorry for the man. So naturally you ask, brother, you insured? <coughs> now the whole topic of insurance, who cares what it is? Halal, haram, doesn't matter. Brother, you insured? And deep down in your heart, you're hoping and you're praying that he says yes. Because if he says yes, you feel what? Alhamdulillah, it's not going to be that bad. But when the brother says to you, Akhi, no, I'm not insured, man, they burnt my car. How do you feel? Wallahi, your heart burns. But the truth is, you and I have been missing the Sunnah of Fajr for the last 20 years of our lives, and not one of us ever was frustrated by the fact we've been missing it at all. A piece of car with some leather in it had more of an effect on your heart than the Sunnah of Fajr that your Prophet is telling you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is worth more than the world and what it contains. You know why? Because we believe in dunya, we don't believe in our prophet. I believe in the reality of this world, I don't believe in the reality of the words of my prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The surah are worth more than the world and what it contains. Yet you and I have been missing it for years. And you've never lost a minute of sleep. But go to work tomorrow and your boss tells you, look, I'm sorry, business is going down, today's going to be your last day. I'd love to see how much sleep you get that night. Why, my brothers? Why does this dunya have more value in your hearts? Why is it that we've lost our track? كُنْ فِي الدُّنْيَا كَأَنَّكَ غَرِيبٌ to live in this world. This is the sunnah of your prophet. We all claim that we're lovers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We all claim that the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is the best. And we all claim this, that and the other. People are going to war with each other. Mosques are going to war with each other. Both of them claiming that we're more on the sunnah than what they are. Where's this sunnah in your life? Come show me. I can show you how big my turban is, and I can show you how long my masbaha is, and I can show you how long my beard is, and I can show you, oh, mashallah, I can, I, can, I can go to war with my theory. But come show me this sunnah. To live in this world like a stranger, like a wayfarer. To really live in this world where this dunya has no effect on your heart. Why? Because I'm dying. I know I'm leaving. It has no effect. What does it matter? I'm going anyway. Any one of you here ever flown? Has anyone here ever caught an international flight? Yes? Ever gone to Dubai or to Abu Dhabi? Anyone here? No? No one flies in London? Yes. When you go to Dubai, how long are you there for? You're in transit, yes or no? Yeah? I'm in transit in Dubai. Sometimes an hour, sometimes two, maximum three, four hours tops. Transit. What do you take with you to Dubai? You take a little carry-on bag, man. 
Has any one of you ever, and you know, look, I know it's a trivial example, but sometimes the mind and the heart, it accepts it a little bit more. If I'm traveling with my friend, yeah, and my destination is Australia, so I'm going from here to Dubai, and from Dubai, I'm going to catch a connecting flight to where? To Sydney, Australia. So where's my final destination? Sydney, Australia. I've packed my bags for Sydney, Australia. Look at the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's so relevant, but there's no hearts to understand it. Live in this world like a stranger, like a traveler, like a wayfarer. Why? Because when I go with my friend to Dubai airport, Dubai, no matter how pretty it is, it doesn't affect me. Why? Because it's not my destination. I'm not interested. Did any one of you ever walk in Dubai airport, sit down and think, you know what, cuz I gotta buy a house here, man. Look how nice this place is. It doesn't cross your mind. None of you ever sat in the airport and said, you know what? Brother, you know what? Business will go hectic here, bro. Doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't even phase you. It doesn't even cross your mind. Why? Because where's your heart? Your heart is set on your destination. This dunya is transit. This dunya is Dubai airport. But unfortunately, our hearts are no longer in Jannah. Where is it? It's here, man. It's here. I love this one. I love this life. I love it. One of the rulers in the past, he asked to see someone that had met a companion. So when he met him, he said to him, tell me something. He said, what's that? He says, why do we hate death so much? Why is it whenever we bring up the topic of death, everyone says, come on, man, why are you... What a party people, bro. We're all having a good time before you mention death. He says, why do we hate the remembrance of death so much? You know what he said? He said, we hate death so much because we have established our dunya and we've destroyed our akhirah. And naturally, you hate to leave that which is established for that which is destroyed. That's why we hate death. If I told any one of you now, leave your fourth focus for a Ferrari, 458, <laughs> you sit, brother, I'll fill out a petrol for you too, huh? You won't even think twice about it, why? But if I told you, brother, would you leave your Ferrari for a fourth focus? Would you do it? We destroyed our Akhirah. We haven't established anything. And everything I've worked for is here. So naturally, I don't want to leave, man. I'm going to end with this. It's been long and the brothers are standing in the back. I'm going to end with this. I want to share something personal. And please open your mind because it may be a fitna. It may be a fitna. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I can clarify it properly. But it may be a fitna. <coughs> This is something that I went through personally, yeah? You know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'm sure we all know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He's the most loving and most forgiving and He's the most just. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. It's no true question. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Doesn't Allah say He's the most forgiving, most compassionate? And, yeah? Yes. You know, this thought came to my mind, and this is, again, please, I, I have to be clear that this is from shaitan. And I openly admit that this initial thought was from shaitan. It's a fitna and it comes. And this is why it's important that we have a shaykh and ulama that we go to and we ask them and they clarify these things for us. So the thought one day came to my mind, you know, and I said, SubhanAllah. And I'm being honest that this is how I was speaking to myself. So no one judge, I'm, I'm, you know, it's an open confession. So one day I sat down and I was saying to myself, Ya Allah, you claim to be the Rahman, Ghafoor, Rahim, and most loving and most compassionate and most merciful. Yet when the kafir dies or when a non-Muslim dies, Ya Allah, you're throwing him in hellfire for eternity. Where's your compassion? Where's this justice that you claim? I mean, the, the, the man was a disbeliever for 50 years, let's say, yeah? He died on kufr and he died on disbelief for 50 years. So, Alright, punish him for 50. Punish him for 100. Double his sentence. But eternity, eternity. So Alhamdulillah, you know, I was 
I sat with one of the mashayikh and, and Allah he amazed me. You know what he said to me? He said the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes them for eternity, and this is very important, this, is, this has nothing to do with non-Muslims. This has everything to do with you and I right now. He says the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes them for eternity is because at the moment that Allah took his or her life, Allah took his or her life at such a point in time that had they lived for eternity, they would in a state where you don't pray. You know what that really means? How many times have you heard, yeah, he was a good boy, man, he was young, subhanAllah, you know. If only Allah gave him two more years. You know what the truth is? The brother that died without Salah in his life, had he lived for a hundred years, he was never going to pray. So basically where I'm going with this is clear. Brother, look at your life right now. If you die tonight, don't you fool yourself. Don't be fooled. If you die tonight in the state that you're in, in the eyes of Allah, had you lived for eternity, you are always going to be the way you are right now. So stop wasting time and stop playing Russian roulette with your life and make a move. Yaqi, don't waste your life. For those of you who don't pray, start praying. I mean, really, is it that hard? Is the mass really that much of a mountain? You know, it's amazing. Wallahi, it's amazing. The brothers, you know, when I talk to them and I tell them, brother, why didn't you come to Fajr Salah? You know, why don't you come to Fajr Namaz in the Masjid? The brother looks at me like, is it? Bro, you must be on some exclusive crack. You want me to wake up and go to the Masjid to pray Fajr? <laughs>